keynote speaker. Thank you and enjoy the day. Good morning, and thank you, Michelle. And uh, I think we could all give Michelle a round of applause for setting this up. So with, with it being the, the first year, hopefully we have many years to come. And uh, we're, we're very uh, happy with the, the turnout and uh, glad you could all join us today. Um, as Michelle said, uh, my name is Tyler Baird. I'm superintendent of Parks and Forestry um, here in Iowa City. And I have the privilege to welcome Carol David this morning um, for our keynote presentation. Um, she enthusiastically accepted our invitation to speak and is a champion of native plants. Carol is the executive director of the Missouri Prairie Foundation, which is a well-established and um, respected land trust. The trust has spent the last 23 years growing an initiative called Grow Native, which I'm sure some of you have heard of, um, as it is a recognizable, recognizable name in the marketing and education surrounding native plants in the Midwest. Carol is also the editor of the Missouri Prairie Journal, a position she has held since 1997. She regularly contributes articles on native gardening, edits field guides, and speaks to groups like ours today um, on native gardening and prairie conservation. So I'm excited to hear Carol speak today on spreading the good word about native plants, and I'll be sure to take some notes uh, to use in our outreach around Iowa City. So please join me in welcoming Carol this morning. Thanks. Good morning, can you hear me all right? Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today to talk about how we, all of us in this room, all of us in Iowa, the Midwest, the country, how we become a native plant nation by cultivating a far-reaching ethic of native plant landscaping. This morning, I'd like to explore strategies for creating widespread adoption of native landscaping to benefit people, pollinators, and the planet. And I really appreciate you inviting me to your symposium. Congratulations to Iowa City for hosting this important event. I look forward to learning from the speakers today and to visiting with you. And I hope when I'm um, done speaking, as long as I keep to my time, I'd love to hear questions, discussion. So, um, oops. Thanks, I, oops, sorry about that. I'm getting too, gotta be careful here. So to introduce you to our organization, we're a 57-year-old land trust. Um, we protect original unplowed prairie remnants. We establish prairie plantings. We run the Grow Native program and we administer the Missouri Invasive Plant Council. Um, we have many partnerships, including um, with Iowa State University. We're working on a, a, a grant to um, recruit more farmers to adopt the prairie strips practice. And in March, I spoke with the Iowa Invasive Species Conference and the Association for Integrated Roadside Management. Um, so we really hope to work more with those groups. And we really respect and admire Iowa's long tradition of native plant landscaping, native roadside planting, and as early pioneers in the native seed industry. Historically, Missouri, uh, like Iowa, was very much a prairie state. This uh, map of the 15 million acres of pre-settlement prairie in Missouri, that's all the orange on the map, was created by Dr. Walter Schrader. He spent 12 summers um, in the basement of the Missouri Capitol looking at general land survey office notes. And from their descriptions of the land, he compiled this map. So my organization works to protect this irreplaceable prairie. Um, our first prairie purchase was a 40-acre tract of land in 1969, which only cost $10,000. <laughs> Since then, we continue to acquire original unplowed prairie uh, through purchase and sometimes land donations. And we've, we've been doing this since 19, the 1960s. But since 2013, we've really stepped up 
um, and we've been protecting more original prairie in that time period than any other group in Missouri. And we're doing this because less than one half, actually about one third of 1% of original prairie is left in Missouri. So time is really of the essence. So of those 15 million acres up until the time of statehood in 1821, there are fewer than um, 45,000 scattered acres of original unplowed prairie left. So um, I'm gonna take you through just real quick um, some beautiful photos of prairie. These are some prairies that we've um, protected in the last few years, in addition to ones we've purchased earlier. Um, this is just 34 acres, but it has over 200 native plant species. Um, this is 171 acres. It really looks like that. It's incredible. Um, has almost 40 plant species that are remnant dependent. Um, this is an, uh, it's actually a 22 acre remnant prairie with 52 acres next to it that we're um, doing prairie plantings on, but it's just 35 miles south of downtown Kansas City, one of the last original remnants in that a metropolitan area. Carver Prairie, 163 acres. We even have a tiny, tiny Lus Hill Prairie. It's only four acres, but it has 10 species of conservation concern on it, and that's um, up very close to Iowa. This 40-acre tract is just unbelievable. It has glade-like and prairie swale areas, so it has a real diversity of plants. Um, we purchased a sand prairie in uh, southeast Missouri, incredibly rare uh, uh, kind of community, and 18 plants and animals of conservation concern. Um, and then last year, we purchased Thoda Prairie. Uh, with permission from the Osage Nation, we used the word Thoda, which means peace. So uh, really excited to be able to protect these. So all told, we have 4,400 acres that we're protecting in 32 tracts of land, and we're always working to protect more. These are all open to the public to enjoy on foot. We have maps and more details about each one on our, um, web, our website, moprairie.org. And I've got some brochures and other handouts out in, in the um, outside of the room. So we recognize that uh, it was the Osage Nation and their ancestors and other Native American groups that expanded and sustained prairie through their deliberate and carefully planned use of fire. And at the time of the forced removal of the Osage Nation members from Missouri in 1825, more than a third, about 15 million acres of the state was prairie, and another third was savanna and open woodland. Um, and we know that the prairies that we work to protect were perpetuated because of native cultures. And we respectfully acknowledge that the land we work to protect was the homeland of a diversity of Native American nations prior to European American settlement. The land in our care continues to have cultural significance for the Osage, Missouri, Sac and Fox, Iowa, Kaw, and other Native American nations. We are mindful that these nations had a significant role in shaping the landscape and that they continue a sacred relationship with the lands we protect. We recognize and appreciate their contributions to the cultural heritage of this region and to the history of North America. We honor them as we protect the ecological integrity of the lands in our care and as we promote native plants, uh, which uh, originate from prairies and other native habitats. So Missouri, like Iowa, is a land of abundant native plant diversity thanks to the wealth of distinct natural communities. So what happened? We lost nearly all of our prairie and wetlands as well as substantial per percentages of other natural communities through land conversion and suppression of fire. And today, common landscaping like this is familiar to all of us. Of course, your yards may not look like this, or if they do, after you've purchased your plants out in the <laughs> here, um, and after you learn from the speakers today, they'll soon include native plants or more native plants. So your yard or parks or school or corporate campuses can reflect the natural wealth of Iowa. And as we've just heard in the introduction, and those of you who live here know, you're already doing an incredible amount of work so your property can be planted with oaks, host to caterpillars of more than 500 species of butterflies and moths, sustaining plump and juicy power bars like this that can become butterflies or moths or become food for songbirds with native plants that provide food for insects, for birds like this chickadee, 
that weighs no more than the equivalent of four pennies, your native landscaping can provide the thousands of insects it needs to feed a nest of young. And with milkweeds and other wildflowers as nectar sources, you are supporting larval and adult monarch butterflies, which despite weighing no more than a paperclip, enchant us with their magnificent migration. You don't have to work for your lawn. You can let your native plants work for you, which is what the native plants and this beautiful, expansive home landscaping in the St. Louis area are doing for this homeowner. Or on a smaller scale, like at my house. With the native landscaping, you are keeping water clean. You're storing carbon in the ground. You're supporting pollinating insects. You're sheltering native bees and helping them be good parents. You're being a host with the most. Your native plants are doing all of this work for you while you just sit back and relax. But don't get too comfortable. Native landscaping, like all landscaping, requires stewardship, but it's worth it. Besides all of the benefits that native plants provide for us, they also generate joy. I take a photo of my husband and son every year during the brief bloom period of our red buckeye. And I show off photos of my sensational cross vine every year to family and friends. It's blooming right now, it's peak. And I get to watch pipe vine swallowtail butterflies laying eggs. So with so much going for natives, how did we get here? How did we end up with expansive lawns and non-native plants originating from other parts of the world that provide little to no ecological benefits here? There are lots of reasons, from the post-World War II growth of suburbia to nationalized suppliers of plants for retail giants to a disconnect from the natural world, and many more. We could point fingers all day long, but we've got better things lined up for today. Fortunately, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, around the country, and especially in the Midwest, the native landscaping movement really began to pick up steam. In 1999, there were two women in Missouri, Judy Allman and Cheryl Riley, who perceived this awakening demand for natives and a great need for them, and set about to grow the industry in Missouri in a big way. So they created the Grow Native program. I'm going to share with you some of the history and activities of the program over its history to illustrate ways to respond to consumer demand for natives and ways to help create it. So the idea for the Grow Native program was pretty simple. It was to increase the supply of and demand for native plants. And um, so from it, starting in 1999, it really did nurture dramatic growth of the native plant industry. And the main components of the program at that time, and, and they remain today, are consumer education, native plant marketing, and native plant professional development. So it was really, it's expanding consumer need and also helping to create consumer need. So from uh, for the first 11 years, the program was run jointly by the Missouri Department of Conservation and the Department of Agriculture. And during this time, foundations of the program were put into place, logo development, brand development. There were tours of native gardens. Um, uh, where conventional plant growers were invited to go on those tours and to tour native plant nurseries. Um, there were workshops for homeowners and professionals. There were publications like you see here that were aimed at specific consumer groups. And uh, we also created a, uh, or developed, and we still publish, a resource guide. It's like a directory of suppliers of native plant products and services. And I've got some out um, outside the room if you're interested in taking one. Uh, the program developed native plant tags for over 200 native species because at that time there, there simply weren't any tags that buyers could purchase. Because um, as you know, you know, native plants are flowering usually for a pretty brief period of time and consumers want to see what the plant looks like you know, when they buy it. Um, and we also created a uh, demonstration garden at the state fairgrounds. And the upper left photo is the Native Landscape Challenge program with St. Louis Chapter of Wild Ones and Shaw Nature Reserve, where homeowners could apply for a grant to get um, plants for a, a native plant makeover. So through all of these activities, demand did increase, and there was an increasing uh, need for supply of native seed, and so the Missouri Native Seed Association was created. And before that, a lot of seed was coming from out of the state and even out of the country. 
So it really helped develop Missouri grown, uh, born and raised native seed. And Allendan, of course, here in Iowa, was a really early pioneer in native uh, seed production. Um, another project uh, was to just more awareness of the native plants available. Um, we created this native plant database. It's searchable. We've added to it over the years um, so that you can make a you know quick uh, planting list if you have you know dry soil and you want fall color or you want to attract butterflies and hummingbirds and you have wet soil and so forth. So through all of this early growth, um, industry surveys between 2003 and 2008 showed um, that native plant sales grew by 70%. So that was wonderful. Um, then in 2011, the state agencies that were running the Grow Native program felt like it would be better for Grow Native to be under the auspices of the private sector and approached the Missouri Prairie Foundation. And so in July of 2012, we became the new home of the program and we've really benefited from all of the work that, the, uh, that was done in the first 11 years. And then we've, we've grown it in a number of ways. Um, for instance, we've, since it's not uh, run by state agencies, we could expand the boundaries beyond the state of Missouri, which um, that service area reflects uh, plant geography, you know, where the plants are. I mean, of course, there's some plants in northern Arkansas that don't uh, grow naturally in, in southern Iowa or northern Missouri, but in general. Uh, and, and we don't include Chicago, for example, because that's really a, a pretty different market, um, a, a horticulture market. And we've also expanded the, the kinds of professional members. Um, we've added cities. We've added um, uh, uh, habitat restorationists. And we've really ramped up educational efforts in 2013. For example, we brought Doug Tallamy and crammed 300 plus people into a room. Um, and so that really, you know, the, the more events you do, the more visibility and that just, you know, feeds on itself. Um, early on, the Grow Native program uh, created these garden plans, um, but we, we updated them with illustrations. And, you know, as we learn more about um, plants that do well, that are really, um, great for landscaping, we've, we've revised uh, to include those. So for example, you know, early 2000s, you didn't see as many native sedges um, being used. And of course, so we've added those, and of course, many sedges are host plants for skippers and other, other insects. It's another one that we revised, um, another one that we revised, oops, and um, created more, uh, including, oops, I'm so sorry. <laughs> It's a test to see if you could, you know, <laughs> subliminal messages, <laughs> subliminal marketing, um, native frog pond. Also, um, you know, we, there is an emphasis on, you know, diverse plantings, and, and obviously diversity is really important. But um, in some areas, I think the way to go is really mass plantings, especially a lot of public areas where you have mass plantings of fewer species. That way it's easier to tell the weeds apart from, you know, it makes a bigger visual impact and you can cover more ground. You know, we've got a lot of ground to cover here. Um, so uh, encouraging mass plantings, native shrub and tree plantings. Again, you know, this is a lot less uh, maintenance intensive than if you have, you know, a perennial, uh, you know, with native grasses and wildflowers, of course, those are extremely important, but you know, you don't have to burn it, you, you know, uh, you don't have to worry about the spent vegetation, you know, built thatch building up, things like this. And you're providing a soft landing for things like moth cocoons. Um, we also um, created a line of plant tags in response to consumers who, gardeners or not, were concerned with the plight of monarch butterflies. And we collaborated with Monarch Watch to create possibly the first set of plant tags that feature an insect life cycle. So these feature eight species that are especially attractive to monarchs. Um, likewise, many people, even if they weren't gardeners, really concerned with pollinating insects, you know, never planted, never garden with native plants before. There's an overwhelming number of plants to choose from. 
So with the St. Louis Zoo, um, we created these tags called pollinator buffet. So someone, you know, walking into a retail, it's easier, easy for them to see. And of course, we know there are many, many other plants besides these that support pollinating insects. But um, we, we started with these and we have a, a calendar, this little green on that curve, it shows the months that they're blooming. So we, we in other collateral material, we stress how important it is to plant things blooming spring, summer, and fall for the whole, to support the various pollinators that are active during those times. We created uh, these native garden signs. Um, we've got six total to help people demonstrate to their neighbors the purposefulness of their plantings. And of course, then came the pandemic, which was horrific on so many levels. But one silver lining was um, remote programming. And we created tons of programming. We continue to do that. Um, we reached thousands and thousands of people, as I'm sure many of your organizations did as well. And that, that's wonderful. It, it created a lot more demand for natives and a lot more demand for native uh, landscaping information. Um, so we, for example, how to care for um, these landscapes. We created a, a, a condensed and an expanded native landscape care calendar, um, promoted this uh, you know, stewardship for stem nesting bees, that graphic from Heather Holm and her um, colleagues. Oh, I'm so sorry, I did it again. And as natives become more popular, large companies pick up on that and also that um, a lot of consumers like natives, but they want longer bloom times or maybe more compact structure. So you see the rise of nativars, which are cultivars of native plants. And so we've created a lot of educational um, materials about nativars to educate people about the difference between nativars and native species. And it, it, there's really not a tremendous amount of research going on in this area. We do know that some native ours, for example, a coreopsis that has double petals that has reduced or absent reproductive parts don't provide nectar or pollen, you know. But, but others may still. Um, we don't know necessarily about the foliage, if the foliage is just as nutritious for leaf eating insects or not, although there has been research on dark uh, colored foliage like um, like nine bark, there's a cultivar of nine bark that has dark foliage, and apparently that's less nutritious than the um, native species. We don't outright, you know, we're not condemning native ours because we're just going by the science. You know, there there might there very well may be some that are as equally beneficial, but we just want people to know the difference and make consume make educated um, purchases. Um, one of the best ways to promote native plants is by showcasing excellent gardens. So we created a Native Gardens of Excellence program. We have 20 um, well-maintained gardens inducted into the program to date in Missouri, Arkansas, Illinois, and Kansas. And these are ones that are, um, they can be managed by professionals or volunteers and uh, have, uh, have evidence that they are well-maintained. We've also been holding native plant sales for about 25 years, um, and we had one on April 15th that drew more than 2,000 people, um, which I think was our largest one ever, and I'm sure you're seeing a lot of um, increased participation as well. And as demand grows for native plants and also native landscaping services, there are more professionals entering the field, which is great, but we still need a lot more. But as there are more professionals, land care uh, professionals especially, entering the field, there's a need, or we feel there's a need to provide uh, professional credentials to certify um, excellent uh, knowledge about native plants and to advance the industry. So we've created this professional certification program, um, sort of you know like a certified arborist program there uh, we, we it, it involves a test and there are four sections to the test as you see there and then certification is maintained um, through uh, gaining uh, uh, continuing education credits and so we just launched this in December and then we just had a second testing period um, a couple weeks ago oops I'm gonna wait here for a second so 
that's an overview of some of the projects that the Grow Native program um, is involved with, and we're proud of what we've achieved. Um, and we have a lot more plans um, to, to expand. We, we've, we've helped grow and meet demand. We've helped create a very informed set of consumers, as many other organizations across the country have done. But we know it's not nearly enough. There aren't nearly enough natives on, on uh, developed landscapes to address really serious environmental issues facing us, from climate change to water quality impairments to pollinator and songbird populations in crisis. So we have to continually reach more people to truly become a native plant nation. And so for the rest of my presentation, I'd like to explore how we might do that. And so to start, I wanna look at marketing. And the basic definition of marketing is a promotion of a product or service. It's what we say and how we say it, so people will buy our products and services. And in terms of native plants, we adhere to this definition and it can be effective. We talk about the superlatives of natives, their beauty, their relatively low inputs of water and fertilizer, ecological and environmental benefits. And this can work very well, but only if the customer has a need for these qualities and values them or is receptive to them. And there are many drivers on a national scale and regional scales that are driving that need. There's the concern over pollinator decline and monarch decline, water quality impairments, climate change. Um, there was a poll in, uh, or results of a poll released in September of 2019 that demonstrated that one out of six young people um, are concerned about climate change and they're taking action. And so these drivers have helped uh, shift culture and have created demand, or they can still create demand for products and services from the native plant industry. Um, but of course there are challenges with direct promotion of natives to new audiences. Almost none of them will bloom the whole growing season. There's not enough supply of native land care professionals. You can't find a place to buy native plants in every community. Some towns have ordinances against planting some of them and they're crawling with bugs. So there are challenging concepts to develop demand. So, you know, we've been ingrained, you know, move water away. Um, but we want, instead of people to move water away, we want them to keep water on their land and use native plants to slow filter and absorb it. We want people to choose plants not just for beauty, but we want to think about the function of plants for other creatures. Uh, we want farmers or cattle producers, instead of planting non-native tall fescue, we want them to plant natives for forage, which in the long, short term is a really big investment. Instead of mowing acres of lawn, we want people to shift the amount of time and money spent mowing lawns to spend it planting, tending, and enjoying native plants. So keeping you know, these new audiences in mind, we have to acknowledge conventional reasons for landscaping and encourage a balanced approach that includes other benefits of landscaping. And changing mindsets and behavior is not easy. We're asking people to change how they spend money and how they spend time. We're challenging conventional thinking about landscapes as not just exterior decorating, but also performing ecological function. We're challenging the consumer to have or to change a framework of responsibility. And this is hard. We read alarming environmental news daily, if not hourly, yet for the most part, we're still going to bed and getting up in the morning and going about our business and the world has not ended. But we all know that environmental degradation is real. It's happening, but it's incremental. And most people do not easily change behavior when faced with ambiguous incremental threats. This was even true in World War II with a very defined threat, Hitler and Nazi Germany. But even then, changing behavior to support the war effort was not easy, as demonstrated by these government posters from the time. This first one, say, asking people to change behavior inside their home, save waste, and then take it someplace. And then the other one um, wanted people to imagine writing with Hitler, <laughs> um, which is super creepy, and I really hope it helped people <laughs> carpool. <laughs> but these posters show you that even with a very defined threat, it was hard to get people to change behavior. 
So at a national level, we need a superstar. We need somebody to rally the troops nationwide. And along has come Doug Tallamy, and he's become our native landscaping national superstar. Yes, let's hear it for Doug Tallamy. <laughs> And his homegrown national park idea is fantastic. It really recognizes individual native landscaping efforts and it does it in this unifying way on a national level. And in case you were wondering, Missouri and Iowa are neck and neck in terms of acreage of native plantings on the map. Missouri is 18th and Iowa is 19th. But this is really healthy competition. <laughs> um, but as fantastic as this idea is, we're not going to get more acreage on the map until we create more consumer need for natives. And so how are we going to do that? So here's an alternate uh, definition of marketing. The aim of, is not about pushing the product, but it's to know and understand the customer so well that the product or service fits him and sells itself. I have not studied marketing formally, and there's a lot I don't know. But in trying to learn more, I learned about Michael Brenner, um, and what he's written about resonates with me, that marketing is a conversation. Great conversations lead to understanding needs. The brands that win more customers are the ones who put their customers ahead of their desire to sell more stuff. They show potential customers that they're interested in solving real problems. And what is a brand? Your brand is something that exists in the mind of your customer. Branding is a judgment, a sentiment, a feeling. And he also talks about the uh, marketing power of storytelling. Storytelling helps create and share experiences. Um, storytelling, which can be visual or verbal, um, sharing that experience you want your cu customers to have or an experience a customer has had that helps attract new customers. And brand ambassadors, such as an existing customer, um, help deliver that message. Or that message, that ambassador could be a well cared for native planting, hence our Native Gardens of Excellence program. Um, Here's an example of a Grow Native professional member. They're called So Wild Natives, and um, they tell their story on their website very effectively. They talk about their dream to own land. They want to share, you know, the joy. Um, Alan Dan has a really nice story on their website as well. Um, here's another example. Green Thumb Gardens is another professional member. This is an Instagram post, and it says. Um, Thank you, Wheelbug, for catching a Japanese beetle on rose turtle head. It, it doesn't say that the rose turtle head is native. It doesn't, it, it's like this little story it kind of evokes this feeling like, oh, good things are happening in nature. It's, it's telling this little micro story. It's solving a problem. <laughs> um, and this is Will Gibson at the podium in the photo there, and he, he's the owner of Green Thumb Gardens. And um, this is another post that he, that he posted. Um, and you've seen the slide, Native Plants Connect Us. That's like a big picture idea. It's, it's addressing a challenge that we have in society. Um, so I thought this was really effective, not only that he had a slide like that, but he posted that message. So Will and So Wild Natives and many others that make up our Grow Native program, both on our committee, this is an old photo, but this is some of our committee, and professional members really um, inspire me. And you know, as you know, those who work in the native plant industry work really hard. It's really grueling work, but they're really passionate about what they do. Um, and I want to share something else that one of our professional members shared with us. Um, Robert Hendrickson, he is retired now, but he worked for many years, maybe in Ohio, I can't remember where he worked, but um, he worked a lot on um, garden center marketing, not, not necessarily native, but just gardening as a whole. And in 2017-18, he compiled 2,500 individual surveys from consumers around the country at retail garden centers, farmers markets where plants were sold, and some um, industry events, and asked consumers why they garden. 
And um, that sur so those surveys also revealed that more American households are gardening more than ever, 77%. And that was in 2018. And there's a lot of information that shows that through the pandemic, that, number, that really increased. Um, and I'll talk more about the other 23% later. Um, so he shared the, the top 10 reasons people garden with us in a, in a conference that we had. And here's the top 10 reasons to unwind and relax, grow fresh, healthy food, be outside with nature, express creativity, um, dig, smell, touch, play in the dirt, have a nicer home, um, have fun, feel good, confirmation of a job well done, to make things pretty, better, um, to teach, spend time with family, children, and grandkids. And so I wanna show you some examples of the, how the Grow Native program and some of our professionals, how they've tapped into these top 10 to create customer need for natives. Um, oh, darn it, sorry. <laughs> this um, graphic here, Papillon Perennials, it's, it's the logo, a name of, of a professional, a Grow Native professional member. And what I find really interesting about this, it doesn't say, well, it does say perennials, but you don't, it, it doesn't really talk about plants. The, the main focus is this dog and a butterfly. So it kind of gives you this, you know, playful, fun feel, which I, th I think is really clever. Um, we know people want to grow fresh and healthy food, and we know that um, native plants planted near um, fruit and vegetable crops provide more food sources for pollinating insects, and then you have more insects to, for your food crops. So we created this um, list of native plants to plant alongside vegetable and fruit plants. Um, promote our uh, Missouri official state fruit tree, the pawpaw. We have recipes using native plant ingredients. Um, sorry. Uh, here's another one. Just a beautiful photo. Just get people thinking, like, oh, are those redbud flowers? Oh, are those violets? Oh, I have those in my yard. And, you know, just get people thinking. Um, container gardens, whether they be with live growing material or dried material, helps people create, you know, express themselves. Creativity. Um, one of our professional members in St. Louis, River City Natives, their plant labels are not photos but illustrations. And it makes them stand out from others that have photos. And it, it, it makes you think of those adult you know, coloring books. It just gives you this, you remember when all you had to do was stay in the lines? Like that was the biggest worry in grade school. <laughs> like it just kind of evokes this kind of calming, at least for me anyway. Um, we developed this top 10 plants to connect children with nature. Um, I, when I was putting this talk together, I was doom scrolling on my phone and I um, saw this ad for something. Spending time in your backyard would be way more enjoyable if you had these clever, cheap things. So, you know, obviously, whoever put this together knows that people, you know, want to unwind in their yard. Um, I don't know that you need to buy clever, cheap things and plastic stuff, but you might heed the words of Dr. George Washington Carver, one of our um, Missourians we're so proud of. To those who have not yet learned the secret of true happiness, begin now to study the little things in your own dooryard. Oh, darn it. And these are some things outside my dooryard um, that are beautiful, and, and that's my out outdoor living space. Those are potter wasps, and they get pollen on their heads as they pollinate the yellow passion flowers. The lower right, the, um, those are the ripening seed pods of partridge pea, but the very lower one is not a seed pod, but it's a caterpillar of the cloudless sulfur butterfly that's a host plant. So, you know, that's amazing to see these things. And it's, it's, you know, don't be ashamed to, to, you know, gush over how beautiful native plants are, you know. Um, we provided information about plants, blame, same blooming time, or complementary colors, or um, contrasting colors. Um, some people really, you know, really want a formal looking front yard, so we created these front yard formal for shade and for sun plans. Um, some people, just having cut flowers or, you know, hairy mountain man or something with a wonderful smell for people to touch and feel if you have a booth. Um, so, so those are some ideas um, to, to explore. Um, but what about the 23% of people who, who don't garden? Um, and various surveys have shown that some of the reasons are lack of money, time, patience, and space. And another reason is likely just 
lack of interest in gardening, but I'll comment on that in a moment. But to address some of these limitations, um, here's a few ideas. You know, there's so many native plants, people get overwhelmed. Just give them a short list to start off with. Provide easy to follow directions um, to, to establish a native garden. Um, this is within the catalog of Missouri Wildflowers Nursery. But of course, a garden of this size, you know, it still takes money, it still takes time and space. So um, promote smaller gardens, like around mailboxes. Um, we created this pollinator garden menu card. Um, just pick three. Pick one plant blooming from this list of spring, one in summer, one in fall. Just, you know, get people started. Make it easy. Container gardening is also a good idea for people who um, don't, you know, have a, maybe they have a porch or a patio, but they don't have a yard. Oh, darn it. Sorry about that. Um, and also, these are plants that I have on my porch, and these are about at least eight years old. I, so you don't have to replant them. So you're saving money and you're saving time. So, so those are a few other ideas. Um, but remember, you know, surveys tell us only things about the people who, who took the survey. There are other people who don't garden, and it might be because they don't own homes or because of entrenched poverty or other serious factors, and gardening is beyond their reach. And while it may be hard for us to understand, there are people of all types, of all socioeconomic backgrounds who are simply not interested in gardening. But it doesn't mean they don't care about environmental issues. They might just need some guidance. And for all Americans, no matter what their circumstances, there are still things we can do. Whenever I see this sign, I think of this. I truly believe that people buy burning bush and hostas or calorie pear because it's what they see as they drive through their neighborhoods, or it's what their parents planted, or they see these plants when they go to the doctor's office, or drop off their kids at school, or go to the library, and retail, and so they have that in their heads, and they go into retailers, and they ask for, and you know, retailers understand that, so that's what they stock, and so people see more of those plants. But if people see more natives on the landscape, I believe demand will grow, and it already has. And there's natives just right up the street here I just saw. And around this building I saw some. And even if people can't afford to buy these plants themselves, they can still learn about them, enjoy them, and benefit from them. And when they're implanted in rural areas and public spaces and in neighborhoods. And that can, even if they don't garden with them, it can, can increase public support for really large-scale initiatives, um, for including natives you know, in specs for, for large um, developments, for example. So let's start seeing natives on farms, in parking lots, mailbox, around mailboxes, commercial streetscapes and residential streetscapes, around libraries, city parks, schools, state fairgrounds, flea markets. We have one professional member. She doesn't have a retail uh, space, so she just sells at events, and she goes to flea markets where she's the only, you know, might be the only native plant vendor, and she just stops people and say, where do native plants belong? And that really gets them, you know, thinking. So she's going to a, a totally new, you know, place for people to see natives. And in your yard, we recently collaborated with St. Louis Chapter of Wild Ones to create these plant labels that, are, that Wild Ones is selling. This is the yard of one of our uh, MPF uh, staff member, Emily Gustafson, and she's got beautiful landscaping. And now her yard is full of these labels. So when people walk by, not only are they admiring the landscape, they know the plants. And that can help, you know, then they can go in somewhere and say, hey, I want such and such plant. So that helps as well. Um, I, you know, nature centers are fantastic. We always need nature centers. Um, but I think it's really important for children to have a field trip to somebody's house where they can see native plants. We don't want people to think, or children to think, that the only place for nature is at a nature center. Um, but we always, we always will need nature centers. Um, but this way people can see, this is, this, is a, this is how you can live. This is what your yard can look like. And on, related to children, um, you may be familiar with studies that children can identify 10 corporate logos, but they can't identify 10 plants. 
You also know about nature deficit disorder and how exposure to nature can help so many aspects of our health to the point that doctors are prescribing daily doses of nature as, uh, you know, as treatments. And this is great, but at the same time, a prescription is a correction. It's a requirement. If we have nature all around us, it becomes part of our everyday life. We won't need a prescription. And with native plants, you'll want to be outside. You'll want to see what's blooming. You want to see what the insects are doing. Your landscape won't be merely exterior decorating that you look at through the window. It's going to be a landscape with you in it. But getting more people engaged in native landscaping is going to take work. It really takes tenacity and it takes zeal. Awareness of ecological degradation, about climate change, about declining bird populations and disappearing habitat. Carrying around this awareness with you, it's exhausting. It can make you upset, it can make you angry. So to keep going, we really have to have strength. But there's something else we need as well. And to tell you what this one other thing is, because we're here in a UNESCO city of literature, I'm going to read a, a part of an op-ed piece um, by the author Jonathan Franzen, who grew up in St. Louis, and I'll let his words tell you. When I was in college, and for many years after, I liked the natural world. I didn't love it, but I definitely liked it. It can be very pretty, nature. And since I was looking for things to find wrong with the world, I naturally gravitated to environmentalism, because there were certainly plenty of things wrong with the environment. And the more I looked at what was wrong, an exploding world population, exploding levels of resource consumption, rising global temperatures, the trashing of the oceans, the logging of our last old growth forests, the angrier I became. Finally, in the mid-1990s, I made a conscious decision to stop worrying about the environment. There was nothing meaningful that I personally could do to save the planet, and I wanted to get on with devoting myself to the things I loved. I still tried to keep my carbon footprint small, but that was as far as I could go without falling back into rage and despair. But then a funny thing happened to me. It's a long story, but basically I fell in love with birds. I did this not without significant resistance because it's very uncool to be a bird watcher. <laughs> because anything that betrays real passion is by definition uncool. But little by little, in spite of myself, I developed this passion and although one half of a passion is obsession, the other half is love. When you stay in your room and rage or sneer or shrug your shoulders, as I did for many years, the world and its problems are impossibly daunting. But when you go out and put yourself in real relation to real people or even just real animals, there's a very real danger that you might love some of them. And who knows what might happen to you then? With tenacity, hard work, and love, one yard at a time, one city at a time, we will create a native plant nation. Thank you. I hope I stayed in my time. Um, and if I did, I'd love to have a discussion or in, in, try to address any questions you might have. I've got a, a mic here. If anyone does have any questions, I'm happy to walk this around. Does this, does this work? All right. Thank you. you had referred to some of like the cheat sheets that were made on your slide for like f flowers that bloom in spring, fall, that kind of thing. Where can we find that? Um, all, all of the things that I showed are on our website, grownative.org. I did bring a few um, hard copies of some th things, and it's, they're out on the table right out here, including um, our Grow Native Resource Guide. A lot of those things that I showed are under a tab on the website called Learn. And we've just, we've got gobs and gobs of information. So you, I apologize, well, I, it's great that we have this, but um, you just have to really kind of explore all the um, things that we have. And, and a lot of our um, webinars are on our YouTube channel. Um, we've got a, a real variety of things, and you can watch them at any time. Um, you know, gardening for native flies to, uh, you know, 
design and uh, landscape stewardship and just on and on. Are there, are there any other questions? Wow, that got really loud, sorry. I have a couple of questions um, about some, some of the terms you used. Glade-like and the difference between uh, savanna and prairie. Sure, I'm sorry. Yeah, I guess here in the glaciated lands, you don't have glades, I guess. Um, and, and glade, like in, in Europe, is means something different. Like glade in England means something different. But um, glade in Missouri, or in the Ozarks, is a kind of like a mini desert, a natural opening within woodlands, usually on the southwestern slope where bedrock is at or very near the soil surface. So there are um, plants that are adapted to very dry conditions. You can think of them as mini deserts or extremely dry prairies. And many of the plants you find on glades, you will also find um, on prairies, but some are, are very, some glade plants are specific to glades. Um, you probably know about Kelly Norris in um, Des Moines, Iowa, who's also a professional member of our program. And he um, uses glade plants in really difficult, um, uh, gr like in um, parking lots that get, you know, just that are very inhospitable places to plant. Um, or he, he refers to hell strips, like if you have a strip between, you know, a parking lot and a sidewalk, you know, where there's very little water and just um, really pretty hostile growing conditions. He uses a lot of glade plants because that's what they're adapted to. Oh, and savanna and woodland, sorry. So um, savanna is basically prairie, but with up to 30% tree canopy. So you have a lot of, you had a lot of savanna in Iowa. Um, and I don't know how much you might have left, but you know, of course, national communities don't exist uh, the way we imagine them. You know, I mean, there's, they don't, they're, but generally, you know, if you think about, you've got open prairie and then you might have that grades into savanna and then that might grade into open woodland, which could have up to 70% tree canopy. And then as you go on lower slopes, you get into tree, true forest. So um, prairie, savanna, and woodlands are fire adapted communities. And then when you go into true forest, they're, they don't re depend on, on fire so much to perpetuate themselves. Have you done very much with um, uh, rural cemeteries for native plants? for unplowed ground and is that is that an, a, an interesting strategy to try I think any strategy to save remnant unplowed prairie is a good one and you're right um, there's such a thing cemetery prairies because the land wasn't plowed you know it was just where the graves were, were placed yet yeah, there's a cemetery in northern Missouri that is um, kind of a refuge for it's got like hundreds of prairie fringed orchids I bet the same, the same is the case in, in parts of Iowa. Another um, place to find remnant prairie plants is along railroads because they weren't plowed either. And in fact, in the late 70s and early 80s, that's what my parents did in eastern Missouri is they walked along rail lines and collected prairie seed because this was like, you know, 79. You know, there just weren't as many seeds available. Um, so, and... You know, I don't know, all the, I mean, hopefully all the cemeteries, you know, the, the, the congregation, you know, if they're associated with the church, the church may no longer be there. But you're right, we really need to be paying attention and making sure that if there's no congregation associated anymore, you know, that somebody's maintaining those. Any other questions? Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. This was really great. Thank you. Um, I, you know, one of the things about Iowa City being a college town, we've obviously got a large student population, a very large population of renters. Uh, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about 
um, strategies for renters, it seems they might line up a lot with that 20, I think it was 27 percent, you know, who, who lack the, the money or the space, right? They don't have control over their space. I wonder if you have any strategies for them. Um, and then also strategies for, like, reaching that population, right? I think while it, it is not a quick fix, it really is important to see natives on the landscape. I mean, the more, then they just become the norm. Um, and, and just like, why do kids know corporate logos? Because they see them. You know, we just, so, so that kind of helps on a kind of societal level. And then, I mean, working with realtors, whether they, you know, own rental buildings or, you know, individual, you know, I think is a really good way to go. We've done a number of presentations to realtors. Um, if, if renters have a patio or a, or balcony, they could do a container garden. I mean, there are going to be, it is hard. I mean, you know, where do you get soil, you know? <laughs> I mean, it, it can be tricky, but maybe renters could have a community garden. Maybe, uh, maybe every, you know, wouldn't it be great if we live in a society where every renter got a garden plot? Maybe there's land in an apartment complex that doesn't have to be mowed. You know, all of these things, this is why I talk about tenacity. It, it, we didn't destroy the environment overnight. That was incremental too. So we're not going to build this native plant nation overnight either. And, and the thing about native plants is you can't, boom, like fix it on a national level because plants are, they're regional, right? They're, so it has to be local. Um, I, I don't know if I adequately answered your question. And, and so then you think, okay, well then how do you convince those people who own those buildings? then you have these one-on-one. -on -one. You, you take them and you show them, look at this caterpillar. It looks like this seed pod. Look at the metallic dots on this monarch chrysalis. I mean, hopefully we're still a society that recognizes beauty and, and marvel of those things. And then you get, then, okay, then they, then, then they go somewhere else, and then they, they say, oh, yeah, I remember when so-and-so showed me that. And then maybe they'll go to a native plant sale. Then maybe they'll meet more people. And then maybe they'll say, you know, I own five rental co you know, properties. I'm going to put in a, a native. Or, it, and it's hard right now, though, because there's such a shortage. So people are going to take anything they can get, right? So whether it comes with a community garden or not, right? But I think um, we just have to be open and um, and express our love for these things and express our love for people that they can benefit from native plants. Um, I wanted to point out that there is a really great example of a rental property in Iowa City that um, residents got together and worked with their landlord to actually uh, put in native a native garden in the health strip between the parking lot and the sidewalk. Okay. It's on Court Street near the intersection of Court and Clark. Um, so between Summit and Clark on Court Street. Um, and uh, if you see any of our Green Iowa AmeriCorps members, I know they were all involved in that, um, in working with our Climate Action Office. So it, it has been done. Hopefully it continues to be replicated. That's yeah. excellent. And maybe, you know, you do a, a native plant tour, a self-guided tour. We've done that too, um, where you have, you know, signs and it, you, you could just be self-guided on a certain day. Like you don't have to worry about it being open all the time, but a certain day when, you know, people have weeded and so forth. And, and you know, you, you got to warm your, warm your way into commission meetings and warm your way into city council meetings and promote what the Iowa City Parks and Rec is doing. Go on your, wherever there's a place for public comment, praise native plants. That then, then the leaders of, you know, the city council, you know, then people see that, oh, residents really care about this, so this is really good. So try to always find ways to praise native plants and, and be specific about why they're important to you and do that in, in, in wherever you can. Um, that's really important as well. 
and, and it gets back to, fr you know, like, doom and gloom, you know, just, but um, people really respond to praise, so that's really important. I have got one more question over here really quick. I think we probably got time for just two more questions uh, before we move on. I have a very quick nuts and bolts question. How do, how do you overwinter your natives in pots? Yeah, and so this wouldn't really work for the renter. So I'm lucky, I, you know, I have a house and I have a pretty big yard and um, we, we do leave the leaves, you know, on, on our beds, but in other areas we do rake them into piles. And of course, see, I'm in, in mid-Missouri, so we don't get quite as cold. So I just sink them in um, a leaf pile um, and then I take them out in, but if you have a garage, you might try that where it's, you know, it's fifth, you know, maybe it's not sub freezing all the time, but it's, you know, maybe 40, 50 degrees, something like that. Um, you might try that in your, like in your garage, if you, you're laughing like it's never that warm in the winter or what? <laughs> no, I mean like maybe if your garage, like I have an unheated garage and it's like 40 degrees in the winter, you know, something where it doesn't, you're still laughing at me. <laughs> so yeah, you might have to replace some of them, but, but give it a try. I think I saw one more question back here. Me again, do you have programs for eradicating invasive non-native plants? So do we have programs for, to eradicate? Non-native, yeah, invasive plants. We do, and well, we're having a webinar coming up on May 10. If, you can also go to moinvasives.org. That's our Missouri Invasive Plant Council. But you have a lot of resources in Iowa, too, um, on invasive plant control, too. Um, so, but yeah, you're welcome to... And I just wanted to close by saying, you know, we have a couple of Grow Native professional members in Iowa. Um, we'd love to work with you on other programming. I mean, you can certainly use and print off any of our stuff and use it. I mean, that's what it's for. Um, you know, the, the, while some of the plants might not be the same that are growing here, the concepts are the same. So please use whatever, you know, you want from our website. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it.